Welcome back to another episode of Thinking Critically. Today I am joined by Dr. David Gorski, who is an American surgical oncologist, a professor of surgery at Wayne State University School of Medicine, and a surgical oncologist at the Barbara Ann Karmanovs Institute, uh, specializing in breast cancer surgery. He is an outspoken skeptic and a critic of alternative medicine and the anti-vaccination movement. He is the author of a blog, Respectful Insolence, as well as a managing editor of the website, Science-Based Medicine. Anyway, David, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, certainly appreciate you coming on. I know that there was a little <laughs> bit of a scheduling conflict and we had to kind of go back and forth, but it's great to keep uh, these, to these things happen. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, anyway, it's it's definitely great to get you on, though, because for me personally, when I was going through a transition of moving away from being skeptical of vaccines uh, in particular, because uh, I do have a, a background due to a parent in mm -hmm. complementary and alternative medicine, uh, the science-based medicine blog that you frequently contributed to, that was something that I started to read more of to kind of learn that my views of medicine were not correct. So I suppose I owe you a bit of a thank you for that. <laughs> oh, well, we're, that's, we're always happy to hear that. And it also is kind of interesting because it goes against a frequent claim of critics of what we do make, which is that we're not changing anyone's minds, that what we're, we're just preaching to the choir, <laughs> that sort of thing. Yeah, I think that I know for me, at least, it was the transition of having to move away from that particular group because there's a strong sort of bond and wanting to preserve your worldview. So you formed your identity, you formed relationships with this group of people that share this similar worldview with you. And unfortunately, you kind of have to break away from that. Um, so it's very, very difficult. So I can understand why people who are in this are kind of stuck in it and choose well, not to do something differently. Well, well, well sure. I mean, fr I frequently point out that, <laughs> let's say an anti-vaxxers for an instance, you know, a lot of these sorts of beliefs, you know, the pseudoscience, conspiracy theories, et cetera, become part of a person's identity every bit as much and every bit as strong as say religion or politics. So changing is, really hard you know when it gets to that point uh, i am not going to change the mind you know of, of say del big tree you know or, or robert f kennedy jr or any other like hardcore anti-vaccine activist you know i'm just not you know mm -hmm. it, 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 changing the minds of people like that is unlikely and even if you manage it and it requires an incredible amount of effort per single person so what we try to do is aim our message at, 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 at look at think of it as like think of it as like vaccination or inoculation and you know try, try to inoculate the casual reader against the claims that they're going to be hearing from the hardcore or aim our message at fence sitters yeah no that's that that's precisely it yeah the uh you know the inoculation or, you know, it's, it's been kind of trending this past year, call, calling it like nerd immunity or something of that nature. Uh, which <laughs> I, had is kind not, of like, I had not heard that term. <laughs> you have not heard that term? No, I, uh, I came across a tweet talking about, you know, because obviously herd immunity is a term from uh, epidemiology. Yeah, sure. yeah. yeah, yeah. So they, they coined the term. Somebody did. I, I can't remember who it was in the yeah. Twitter sphere. Weird. I um, haven't heard of it, but okay. <laughs> yeah. Nerd immunity. But anyway, yeah, the inoculation and then the fence sitters. And that's... Um, mm -hmm. Intelligence speculation. What I do now, kind of looking it's, to the people that have come uh, come before me, such as yourself, is trying to go after that group of people who are just unsure of what's going on. They're not like super it's ingrained also, one way or the other. Sure, it, it's also sometimes called pre-bunking as opposed to debunking. Okay. Very interesting. Yeah, I've heard different terms for that. So like the the, the pre-bunking or the inoculation. So I had a gentleman by the name of John Cook who is. A, uh, so he, he's an associate professor, but he's also the, he started the website Skeptical Science about global warming. Right, right. And in particular, how to, you know, all the various arguments for global warming that you, you would come across and things of that nature. 
Uh, but anyway, he's done a lot of research into what's known as inoculation, which is essentially what you're referring mm -hmm. to with the pre-bunking. I think it's just, it's probably the same thing, but just different terminology where you expose people to essentially all the, the claims. Flawed, yeah, the claims right. and flawed arguments, and you tell them what the flawed arguments are going to be. And then when they come across it, uh, then the chances of them actually believing it are diminished. I mean, I actually kind of like to go even a bit meta on this because uh, if, if there's one thing that I've come to the conclusion of over the last few years is that all science denial is based in conspiracy theory. And, and I, I mean all of it. You know, people will sometimes come up to, come up to me and say, "No, no, no, this one doesn't." I can almost, I can always find the conspiracy theory. You know, and the, and that conspiracy, and the reason there has to be a conspiracy theory is if you're denying a well-established science, you know, like or some well-established finding of science, such as that vaccines don't cause autism, there has to be a reason why the entire scientific community doesn't believe that. That's where the conspiracy comes in, you know, that, that there is some, you know, it's either big pharma, it's um, whatever, um, it's, uh, you know, they are trying to keep the truth from you, you know. Yeah, I, uh, I really like that coin, that, that term, they, like who exactly are they? They are trying yeah. to keep the truth from <laughs> yeah. you. So I can definitely relate with the conspiratorial thinking underpinning any sort of like science denial. Uh, I know from my time with CAM, uh, I embraced a lot of conspiracy theories myself, and this was the probably the primary motivation of my belief system. Uh, in particular, so Big Pharma, you know, you mentioned Big Pharma right. earlier, and yeah, so for me, Big Pharma, you know, attacking those guys, you know, these, these were these guys were the boogeyman, they were the they, so. I, yeah. Kevin Trudeau, natural cures that they don't want you to know about. You know, remember that book from like 15 years ago or something like that? I do, yeah, I do. I know that book well because uh, how I had got involved with Cam was through a parent and my parent was a big Kevin Trudeau fan and that mm -hmm. guy is just a fraud. <laughs> well, he was, I mean, he was a total scamster and, and a lot of them are, it's kind of funny, it's, a combo, it's often a combination of conspiracy theories and grit. <laughs> you know, it's, and I think thinking about it, you know, kind of in the overall meta way of, you know, all of these are based in conspiracy theories, lets you start to think about science denial, the various forms of it, as simply a form of conspiracy theory. And it also, you know, all these people who are, who are surprised at how fast anti-vaxxers teamed up with COVID deniers and teamed up with, you know, ultimately QAnon. Well, there you have it, you know, <laughs> it's like. Yeah, it's like one gigantic group of just disinformation spreading conspiracy theories on all sorts of nonsense. And they're all, they all teamed up. Well, and... I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, they all were attracted to each other, you know, and also, yeah. you know, um, I've seen QAnon referred to as like an er conspiracy theory, you know, like this overarching conspiracy theory that can basically suck in every other conspiracy theory. And yeah, it does seem to be, there seems to be some merit to that viewpoint. <laughs> yeah. And it's just so damaging, so damaging today in t today's world uh, of what, it, uh, of what it's actually doing to the social fabric of society. But anyway, before uh, before I, like we get really into that, I am really curious to hear about your science journey because you have an interesting uh, science background. So you have a uh, medical degree as well as yeah. a PhD, correct? Correct. And um, you had, you actually didn't do. That I was in training way. for I was in training for so long that I was like almost thirty seven years old before I had my first real job. <laughs> oh my goodness! Okay. That, so, is, that is quite some time, but yeah, so did the- Well, you th well if you, you think about it, okay, there's, um, okay, so college is four years, so you're up to 22, you know. Medical school is another four years, you're up to 26. Uh, between residency, P 
PhD in fellowship that's, you know, five years plus three years, and that was with his PhD, and another three years, so, you know, 11, 11 more years, you know, it, it, you, already in, you're already into early middle age by the time you, uh, <laughs> by that's the time true. I actually became an assistant professor. Um, and to be honest, through most of that, I was not, you know, although I was a scientist, I don't think you could call me a skeptic in the sense that I self-identified as one or that I really thought about it much. It was the sort of thing that didn't really hit me until the late 1990s. Um, I had, fit, I mean, first of all, when you're in graduate school, medical school, residency, if you have, if you weren't already into skepticism, your chances of you having time to explore it and become, you know, and become a skeptic or actually start doing what I do now is pretty is pretty unlikely, you know. And this is, you know, this residency, this is a general surgery residency back in the day, before the, back in the days before there were work hour limitations. So it was like every third night on average call and you know 100 plus hour weeks easy sometimes it was every other night call so you're not going to have time for that you know I, I barely had time i barely had time to get enough sleep to keep myself conscious you know and even then you know chronic sleep deprivation yeah. was the way was the way back then um which is something that i never really understood and today i know it's not Oh, I'm not going to be one of those. <laughs> I'm not going to be one of those old fart surgeons who go on and on about. Oh, you know what the disadvantage of every other night call is? You miss half the cases. I'm like, no, no, no. I hated every other night call. I hated every third night call. You know, I almost quit it. I almost quit on at least one occasion because I was getting so totally burned out. But you know, I did ultimately make it through. Um, in any event, so coming back to uh, skepticism, so are you are you at all familiar with Usenet? Because it, I feel like a fossil whenever I bring up Usenet. Uh, Usenet? These days. No, I, I am not. Is that something? Is See, that I told you, the 90s? I, 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 <laughs> uh, it goes back to the 80s even, but I didn't oh really discover okay. it until the 90s. Um, mainly when I was a graduate school student and a fellow, like. Uh, I first discovered it when I was a graduate student in the early 90s. It's basically, a, think of it as a worldwide discussion forum that was decentral, it's decentralized um, so that like any host could get in on it and get subscribed to whatever news groups. And, you know, it was kind of distributed over many, many computers, um, basically every ISP at the time had a Usenet server that, you know, uh, kept, you know, kept copies of the news groups and would sync, you know, with all the others. Um, in any event, somehow, and I do not remember how I did, somehow, and I don't remember how, and it was sometime around mm, 1998, maybe, give or take, you know, when, when you get past 20 years, the time starts to get hazy as far as like the exact time. So somehow I discovered a Usenet news group called alt.revisionism. And all of these Usenet groups had like a, a prefix kind of, a three letter prefix kind of name with a dot, you know, with a period and then whatever it was about. And sometimes there were more than one periods as they were little subdivisions of the main, you know, branches uh, called alt-revisionism. Now the revisionism in that was Holocaust revisionism. So this is okay. okay. So this is like early. So this is lab. a Holocaust. This is a Holocaust denial news group. Okay. Um, and you know, I can, I can, I can send you the link of when I wrote about my, how I discovered this because I wrote about it like in two thousand and five, not long after I started the blog. Um, in any event, um, so I discovered. I, I came across these posts by this guy who went by the name of Polakowski, you know, and, and from his English, from his English, I think he probably really was Polish, you know, or because, you know, it was, a, it was SKI, so it was a Polish, not a Russian name. And he was going on and on about how the Nazis actually 
practiced ethical medicine and like how the inmates at Auschwitz were actually well taken care of. And he was going on about how when they couldn't work, um, they were, um, how do I want to put, how do I want to put it? Uh, they, they were, they, they were, they, they were like, they were, when, when they couldn't work, that they would be taken out and like fed milk until they could work again and, and all sorts of these weird things. And then he was getting into the different kinds of starvation and claiming that they weren't really start, you know, that they weren't really starving. And I started getting into it and going through how this was all ridiculous and et cetera, et cetera. And from that point on, I got, kind of sucked into refuting Holocaust denial kind of more in general. Like I started getting into the other claims, you know, there were the, there were the famous claims about how there were no gas chambers or that the gas chambers were, that they did find were actually not used to kill people, but they really were delousing gas chambers. Um, and I started learning about how you could, you know, deny um, incredible quantities of evidence from many different sources that all converge on the same conclusion that the, you know, that the Nazis um, engaged in a mass extermination campaign, primarily aimed at Jews, but that also encompassed, men, you know, a lot of other groups. And, you know, kind of like mind blown, you know, that people could <laughs> think this way. Yeah. And, you know, and I did, you know, I did, that was my primary, primary skeptical outlet for at least a couple of years. Um, so you primarily focused on then Holocaust denial and then at some point. Correct, correct. And then yeah. I, you know, like I read Deborah Lipstadt's book on Holocaust denial and, 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 you know, around 2000 was her trial with David Irving, if you remember that at all, uh, when the, she had written a book in the early nineties mm -hmm. about Holocaust denial in which she basically correctly called a British sort of amateur historian by the name of David Irving a Holocaust denier. And so he sued her in British court because of course, you know, British court is very plaintiff friendly when it comes to libel. And it was, it was a big story. They made a movie out of it a few years ago, you know, like maybe three or four years ago uh, with Rachel, uh, what was her name? So Rachel Weiss. Um, playing Lipstadt, and I forgot who played uh, David Irving. Um, but, you know, it, and, you know, I followed that trial, the writings about it, et cetera, you know, um, because it was all very interesting. You, you learn how uh, pseudo historians, much like pseudo scientists, um, handle evidence, you know, yeah. how they distort evidence, how they cherry pick evidence, how they come up with conspiracy theories to explain missing evidence or evidence that doesn't go, you know, doesn't support what they're trying to say. So or they just engage, yeah, they engage in speculation and right. they present or, or, it, they, they present it as evidence. They take, they take speculation, right. they put it, they, they use speculation to fill the gap. And then they say, this is evidence when it's really just speculation. Well, there's that too. There's yeah. that too. But it, you know, it turns out that all denialists, whether they're science denialists or denialists of any sort of, academic discipline use very similar techniques. Now it was around that time, like in, I think it was late 1999 or, or maybe in 2000 that I discovered another Usenet use group called, uh, oh crap, um, it was an alternative medicine news group. And for some reason I'm totally blanking on the name of the news group, which is incredible. Um, oh, alt.med.alternative, that's right, uh, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I'll double check. <laughs> it, yeah, I swear. The, I swear. I, I, you know, like, like whenever whenever I have a little memory failure, I like to I like to say that I uh, I blame the uh, I blame the early onset Alzheimer's. Yes, there that's what, <laughs> yeah, that's in any excuse. but in any event, my, my my excuse is it was 20 years ago. So that, okay, it was more. That's, so I'll I'll give it that. That's good enough for me. Good enough for me. Um. And I'm sure someone will email you or me and say, you idiot, it was this, but in any event. Um, so I started look at seeing alternative medicine claims. And of course, because alternative medicine and anti-vaccine beliefs go together, you know, uh, so well, 
um, there was a lot of anti-vaccine stuff in there. And that was basically where I first started encountering the claims about Andrew Wakefield, which were fairly new at that time, you know, since, given that his Lancet paper was published in, you know, God, 21 years ago next month, February 1998. Um, and I started getting into those. And so basically Usenet was my primary outlet until, um, and at the time it was either if it, when it wasn't Holocaust denial, it was alternative medicine or anti-vaccine stuff, uh, especially cancer quackery. Uh, and when it wasn't one of those, it was Holocaust denial. And this went on until 2004 when, by 2004, by the, you know, given the rise of web-based uh, discussion forums and, and that sort of thing. And, and yes, it was before the rise of Facebook and all the other social media still, but there were blogs, you know, there were blogs. And on a cold gray December, day uh, in 2004 after having read an article I recall in the in Time magazine about you know the popularity and the rise of web blogs I made myself a uh, a uh, blogspot account if you remember that if you remember blogger and blogspot probably not but that was like the big platform back then um, I don't even recall if Google had purchased it yet back then as a, but you know, it's now under Google, as is almost everything. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so, um, and I started the first iteration of respectful, respectful insolence. Um, so 2004, that was the, the genesis. Well, I mean, I, I really, I mean, my first, my first, my first serious post was like right before the holidays of 2004. Um, and I, then by January, I started to pick up, you know, and um, I guess my first big splash, like the, my first post that went what you would call viral, you know, or I don't remember if we called, go, called it going viral in those days, but the first big, the first post that I did that got a lot of traffic and attention was in June of 2005. And it was a, in, it was a discussion of Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s uh, article that was published simultaneously for reasons that I still don't understand in Salon.com and Rolling Stone. Uh, it was an article called Deadly Immunity. And uh, it was uh, basically about uh, the claim that mercury and the thimerosal preservative that had been in vaccines until about 2000, in, several childhood vaccines until about 2002 was a major cause of what, you know, they were calling the autism epidemic. Um, and then- Which has been thoroughly debunked. Uh, more time, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm at the point where I just say it's been disproven. I used to say it's unproven and that, you know, given the size and, size and number of epidemiological studies that have failed to find even a whisper or a whiff of a hint of an association between thimerosal and autism, that the most that you could say that is if there is any association or causation, it's so tiny that those studies missed it. Um, I mean, now I'm just, you know, it's one of those things, it depends how dogmatic you want to be about saying that science can never prove a negative, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, at some point, you have to bow to practicality and say, look, it's been disproven, you know, it's been studied over and over and over again, and nobody reputable using good methodology and doing decent sized studies has found any hint of an association. Uh, you have to qualify it like that because anti-vaccines will always be able to point to crappy studies done by, you know, the anti-vaccine sympathetic um, or outright anti-vaxxers like Wakefield. Interestingly, which I did not realize at the time, um, his article also was the first anti-vaccine conspiracy theory that I uh, encountered because it basically it told the story, well, well, basically its central claim was that the CDC knew that vaccines cause autism, but was covering up the data, you know, that, that showed that. 
and it, and it went on about the story. It went on a, about a story about a CDC meeting held in Simpsonwood, which is like a conference hall in one of in an Atlanta suburb in the year 2000, which is kind of when the whole claim that thimerosal and mercury in vaccines might cause autism was starting to blow up. And um, the idea was that there was a study in, in the, that where the raw data showed an association, but when they started adjusting for confounders, the association went away. Well, you know, this is, this, this is epidemiology. This happens all the time. Most associations that you find with the raw data or with the preliminary analyses go away when you start appropriately adjusting for confounders. But to the anti, the end to you know, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., you know, RFK Jr., portrayed it as you know a conspiracy to suppress the association, you know, by manipulating the numbers. And this is a common theme that you know we come across in science denial. Any appropriate analysis or adjustment to them is an attempt to hide the truth, you know, rather than yeah. to appropriately adjust you know appropriately analyze the data yeah precisely like they, they they don't have the prerequisite scientific training to know that in order to properly analyze the data that these are standard techniques that are used so you can't right. just take raw you just can't take raw data and say oh, okay anything goes with it um, there are strict protocols with how you're supposed mm -hmm. to approach it otherwise what comes out the back end of it could be nonsense if you don't abide by the strict protocols and jumping ahead, just to, just to be, just as an aside, jumping ahead about it 10 years, you know, 10 or 11 years, uh, have you heard of the movie Vaxxed? I have. I actually, okay. I actually watched that documentary. I <laughs> oh, well, to see, I did. I, I've watched I won, it too, yeah. So I, yeah. I wrote a long review on it for science-based medicine and respectful insolence. Um, so the conspiracy theory behind Vaxxed, do you remember what that is? It is something to do with a CDC whistleblower, right? Like something like right, that. right, right, yeah. right. So the, the, the claim is that um, uh, that a CDC scientist was a quote unquote whistleblower who showed or who, who told people, you know, who was trying to say that the CDC was hiding evidence that showed that the MMR vaccine increased the risk of autism in African American boys by 3.4 fold, which means you know a four a four plus increase in the risk of autism in African American boys. That conspiracy theory is based on the same sort of thing, which is that yes, in some of the raw data in a small subset of the analysis that was done uh, from a 2004, or is it 2003, 2003, 2004 study published by the CDC uh, about you know, looking at uh, autism in the Atlanta area and trying to associate, you know, see if there was an association with the MMR vaccine. Um, the, uh, you know, th that went away when it was, you know, when confounders were adjusted for it. There were some other elements uh, about uh, checking birth certificate data and stuff like that and trying to, you know, trying to approach, in any yeah. event, it was, it was an association that went away. And even if it was real, it was such a small number of actual cases that it could easily have been spurious, you know, so, uh, but. So it was a very small yeah. sample size. Well, well, I mean, it was a small subset, you know, it was basically okay. a, subset, a very small subset of the overall uh, population. So in any event, from that was born, and thanks to Andrew Wakefield um, and uh, Brian Hooker, I don't, I don't know if you've heard of Brian, he was in the movie, but you know, he is a, he is a biochemical engineer who fancies himself an epidemiologist and statistician. And he's bad at both of them. Um, <laughs> but his, but I, I mean, he was quoted. I can't. The video disappeared off YouTube, and I can't find it anywhere. But I fortunately had quoted him on it uh, when it was still available. Uh, he was. Uh, uh, it was him giving a talk, going on and on about how he likes simple analyses, 
you know, which to which I always respond in epidemiology, the simple analysis is usually wrong. You know, it's like you have to you have to um, account for con confounder potential confounders, and you know, you have to do it appropriately. And that's why epidemiology is hard, and that's why statistics is hard, and that's why get you know figuring out what might be relevant confounders is hard. Um, simple analyses are quite often wrong. You know, sometimes yeah. they're right, but more often than not, what you find in anal analyzing the raw data doesn't hold up once you start, you know, uh, accounting for the various confounders that could explain that, you know, the, the and, apparent association. And just, and just for clarity really fast, David, so when you say confounders, you're talking about confounding variables, right? So for people confounding that are Confounding variables in, that yeah. might explain the association and that when you like correct for them, the association goes away. Yeah. Um, so it's basically so, things that can ruin the analysis. You determine that. Right. I mean, I mean, for instance, let's say you have two groups and one group, you know, the vaccinated group versus the unvaccinated group. And let's say there's an imbalance. Let's say that the parent parental age in the vaccinated group is higher. And you're looking at autism as your outcome. Well, we know that there is an elevated incidence of autism with increased paternal age. So that, you know, you have to account for that in your analysis, because if you don't, you know, you would expect that the vaccinated group in that particular study would have a higher, higher rate of autism, but it could, that higher rate could well just be because the parent, you know, the paternal age is higher in that group, you know, on average. Just as one example, I mean, there are you know thousands of examples of things that you know socioeconomic, you know, for cancer, you know, various so looking at cancer mortality, for instance, you know, so you have to account for socioeconomic status. You have to account for risk factors. Like, let's say you have an imbalance between two groups in smoking. You know, <laughs> you know, if you don't account for that, you know, the group with the smoking is going to have a higher incidence of lung cancer. Right? Yeah. So I think and if I you're think not the, I think the more, if you're not, and if you're not studying smoking as a cause of lung cancer, then that could screw you up if you're studying yeah. some other factor. Yeah, and I, I think the uh, the takeaway for people that are watching this is that <laughs> science can be very difficult, and if you're not careful, uh, what you get out of the back end of the scientific process could be wrong, which is why you know you're talking about confounders when you're when when you're looking at raw data. I mean, right. you. You know, as an epidemiologist, as a some some sort of other right. scientist, uh, and you are using I'm, statistics, it's really really important that you account for what are known. So you refer right. to them as confounders, right. confounding right. things, and, confounding and, and, and it's not it's not just epidemiology. If you look, for instance, at the gold standard medical study, you know the double blind, placebo controlled randomized trial. If you don't make sure that your two groups you know, are matched pretty well in relevant factors that might affect outcomes like age, sex, et cetera, you can come up with a wrong result too. You know, it's. Uh... Yeah, it's, yeah, science, science is definitely challenging, which is, you know, again, with a singular study. So a, a singular study, let's say, for example, of something new, uh, particularly, um, you know, let's just, let's, we're talking about medicine. Let's look, so let's pick medicine. Even if, uh, you know, even if it makes it through peer review and it gets published, you know, going back to what you're talking about, uh, you know, with the confounding factors, things of that nature, how important it is to then have more data. I mean, because even if you have a small sample size and again, it gets published, goes through peer, peer review, it's really, really important then that you don't change everything based off of that one singular study. Well, I suppose well, sure. that's a point I mean, that I'm trying to. I suppose the point right, I'm trying right, to make no, is that no, science sure. is hard. And, yeah. and, and science deniers are masters at cherry picking the studies that support what they believe, you know, and, yes. and ignoring all the other, uh, all, ignoring ignoring all the other negative evidence. Um, and I also like to say, post peer review, in other words, post publication review by your fellow scientists, is actually more important than peer review. I mean, peer review can miss a lot. Peer review is just there to catch glaring methodological errors, and it doesn't always manage to do that. You know, I, I like to say, you know, peer, 
you know, peer review is like the best, is the worst system we, the worst system imaginable, except for all the other ones that have been tried, you know, to, to butcher <laughs> that Winston Churchill yeah. quote or that, or that he cited. Um, in other words, you know, it's, no one says peer review is perfect or, and no one says that, and peer review is notoriously bad at catching fraud. You know, that, that, you know, that's one thing that peer review is notoriously bad, you know, not very good at. Um, and I, and some of it is not because we're not really trained to look for fraud. You know, I review papers, to, you know, not, not as many as a lot of scientists, but I do review papers, you know, a bunch of papers a year. And we're not trained to look for fraud, you know, and we, we don't, and a lot, most of us don't even really know what to look for. Um, I mean, some things might be obvious, but numbers that are too perfect or something like that. But even then, how do you know that it didn't just happen that way? Because, you know, sometimes, you know, by random chance alone, you'll get some pretty nice look, <laughs> looking numbers. This is true. I think that that's a really good point. <clears throat> what you said about peer review is that it's not a perfect process. Uh, it's I, in place uh, because it's a good system to have in place, checks and balances, but it's certainly not perfect. And that once the paper does get published and it's out there, then the post-publication review process, so other scientists can read it. And yeah. then if they find something intriguing, then try to replicate the results. And usually that's when the fraud is is caught is right. after it's published because then somebody else tries to go and do it and say hey something's going on here then another group looks at it and then eventually um, as more time passes you realize that this is a fraudulent paper which is why it takes a long time sometimes for well, papers to be retracted well look at look at andrew look at the the, the, the example of andrew wakefield you know his what well, the fraud was not detected by scientists. The fraud was detected by an investigative journalist named Brian Deere. And it took 12 years to get that paper retracted. You know, it was not retracted until 2010, you know, so. That's a long time. I didn't realize it took that long to get retracted. Was it, I forget if it was 2009 or 2010 when his paper was retracted. It, it um, again, one of those things. If I if, if I had known we were going to talk about this, I could have gone and looked it up. But you know what? You know, memory. Uh, 2009 or 2010 was when the but you know in rapid succession his paper was retracted and he he lost his medical license in the UK. Yeah, that's that just seems like such a long time. I for some um, reason I didn't I didn't recall it taking nearly a decade or excuse me over a decade. Uh, a little over a oh, decade. Yeah. In order no, to it do was that. published That's... in 1998, and okay. uh, and it was 2009, 2010 before, you know, it was gone. Okay, wow, that is a long time. But anyway, okay, so you started res respectful insulin. So you got in, you got into skepticism when you were in uh, when you were in school, mm -hmm. uh, graduate school. Started reading reading some forums. Well, I, my my, fel my fellowship actually, I had already gotten my PhD by then. Okay. All right, so fellowship, 90s, reading forums, that's how you kind of got into skepticism, mm -hmm. started with Holocaust denial, started respectful insulin in 2004-ish, uh, 2005. And I'm just curious as what it means to be a skeptic, I guess. What exactly is a skeptic philosophy? I mean, I know that there's a debunking component to it, uh, you know, and it <laughs> well, particularly goes after pseudoscientific claims. Right. Uh, in general, I see a lot of well, well, the skeptic I don't, community. I don't, I don't really limit it to pseudoscientific claims. Okay. Um, let's see, how would I best put this? You know, and don't I, I don't really consider myself any sort of great thinker about the nature of skepticism or anything like that. Uh, however, what I do think is that basically skepticism, you know, I, I like to think, think of what I do as essentially scientific skepticism. And one thing, and yes, debunking is important. However, you also have, I, I think there also has to be a willingness to go where the evidence and science lead. Um, and again, as I like to say, skeptics are human and a lot of even big name skeptics 
have some blind spots where, yes, they go where the evidence leads when it's, except about this one area, you know, <laughs> you may have yeah. noticed that. <laughs> About this one or two, this area, no, 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 they're almost as bad as any denialist. There are, you know, there are unfortunately not a, not a small number of examples of that. Um, one, you know, I, I, here's one I like to, I like to mention, um, although it's not, I don't think it's as big of an issue as it was, say, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, there was a way, there were a number of skeptics or, you know, self-proclaimed skeptics who liked to, who were, who actually flirted with, you know, uh, climate science denial. And you may, re you may, you may even recall that James Randi himself, like maybe 12 or 13 years ago, p published something where he was questioning whether global warming was happening due to human activity. Really? And Yes, yes, this did happen. I did not happen. know that. Um, I did not know that because he's probably, I mean, no, from he, the skeptic did, groups and, and, that I follow, he's kind of, he's like the progenitor of the skeptic. Well, he's sure. Kind of, yeah. Right, right, yeah. Um, and he, you know, yeah, and he was taken aback by, I think, the reaction, you know. So that's actually another thing about skepticism that I like to, like to point out is that if you're doing it right, even your you know, even your leaders or your famous skeptics or your gods, if you want to put it that way, are not, you know, sacrosanct. You know, if they screw up, you know, and we're all human, we all screw up, and I'm sure I probably have at some point. Uh, you know, I know, I know, I have, but I, 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 if there is an area though where I'm a denialist, I haven't quite figured out what it is yet. Perhaps someday someone will tell me if it happens. Um, but he was kind of taken, he was taken aback by the criticism, you know, and he kind of, he kind of backed off. Um, Penn Jillette was a total climate science denier for a long time. And I suspect still has a bit of that in him. I, I distinctly remember an amazing meeting, like in the, uh, was it 2009 or something like that? It was in that, it was somewhere in that period where he was, someone asked him a question about it, you know, cause I guess they did an episode of the, his show, of the Penn and Teller show, you know, that was on Showtime at the time called, you know, Bullshit. You know, mm -hmm. you remember, remember that show that was- Yeah, I do. Yeah. Questioning global warm, you know, human, induced or human caused climate change. And he kind of backed off and was like, uh, oh, you know, is, is, is the world getting warmer? Um, you know, yes, it appears that, you know, it appears that it's getting warmer. Are humans causing it? And his, his big thing was, I don't know. Which I guess is better than saying, than denying that it's happening, but it's kind of, you know, I, I think a face, it was kind of a face saving way to kind of retreat, <laughs> you know, and, and yeah. sort of admit he was wrong without admitting he was wrong. If you, it, I guess you could put it that way. Or not taking a stance or something on it. Or, 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 or yeah, retreating I mean, yeah. to just not taking a stand yeah. instead of, you know. <laughs> yeah, which, at the time, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how old that episode is, but even if it's after, you know, yeah, I'd have you to know, look, I, we, we've it, known. We, I, I, I mean, mean the, it was evidence, the evidence has been overwhelming for for decades now that humans. Well, oh, the are evidence causing. has been overwhelming yeah. since like the '80s. So yeah. it, it's yeah. like uh, <laughs> I, I like to point out, for instance, you know, one of the climate skeptics' favorite tropes is that back in the '70s they were worried about global cooling, right? Yeah. I, a while back. I rewatched Soylent Green. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. I've seen bits and pieces. It was Charlton, I've, I've, Charlton Heston. Charlton well, the Heston, idea was yeah. overpopulation, et cetera, et cetera. This is a movie from 1973, I believe. It was definitely the early 70s. And part of the movie was mentioning the climate was getting warmer because of human pollution. <laughs> you know? So even in a Hollywood movie, in 1973, it was, you know, it was appreciated that 
this, if not the consensus, at least there was a lot of science suggesting that we were making the planet warmer. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's remarkable to me that people still won't acknowledge anthropogenic global warming or that humans are having an impact on the planet warming. Um, I still, particularly on social media, when a large outlet publishes anything mm -hmm. on global warming, <laughs> the number of people in the comments there who will say, I don't know, you know the climate's changed, has That's changed right. for millennia. And, 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 There's all these sorts of arguments. They're just not admitting the science that's been done on this and what's even more alarming than saying that is that a entire political party in the united states has now kind of embraced that position too and you know <laughs> that's actually fairly recent um in 2008 john mccain was acknowledging that global warming was you know the human caused global warming was a problem before that the republican party most of them did acknowledge it. They just didn't really want to do anything about it or they would have these, they, they would want to do some sort of market-based approach or whatever, you know, they just didn't believe that the government had a role or had a huge role in trying to mitigate climate change by, you know, Pat, you know, passing laws and like regulations that, yeah, yeah, exactly. that force you know, and that's, companies that, that's to a, pollute that's a re less, to emit yeah. less carbon, to, you know, yeah. And that's a reasonable position to have, okay? So if you want to debate the solutions, that's fine. Do we want market-based solutions? Do we want policy-based solutions, a mixture of both? How exactly are we going to do it? As long as you're acknowledging that it's a problem and that we need to work towards a solution. The but, but then they Sometime pivoted. after 2008, yeah. they, and it happened pretty fast. They basically, you're right, the whole party embraced the idea that, that it's either not happening or humans aren't causing it. You know, the, are all the denialist tropes about climate science. Um, although there is kind of a wing of the Republican Party that's like, actually, things are getting better now that things are getting warmer because more of the planet can be cultivated. You know, <laughs> something like, you've heard that one, I'm sure. I've heard that, yeah. I, I've and, and I'm not so even, you know, it's not even, it's not even my main area of skepticism. I don't write about it very often, you know. Uh, I do occasionally, but you know, and, and even I know these things. You know, it's like the, those who are climate scientists, you know, like who have been trying to push back against the denial, like you know, like Michael Mann, for instance. I, I don't know how they deal with it. On, on the other hand, they probably don't deal. How, they probably don't understand how people like Paul Offit deal with deals with deal with anti-vaxxers so that has to be the worst paul paul offit dealing with anti-vaccination individuals because i that to me that seems more scary than the the, the climate skeptic individuals yeah I, I mean you also have to you know in in the and then this this brings in you know the whole role you know these conspiracy theories can grow up organically but they can also be fed and stoked and you know in, in climate science clearly you know industry you know fossil fuels industry has stoked a very powerful you know machine to promote the message that it's not a problem or the humans aren't causing it etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and to do whatever it takes to um, stop or slow down any sort of government policies to mitigate it because those policies cost them money and profits. Um, in fact, it's kind of funny, you know, the whole conspiracy theory on the science denial side, you know, is that, you know, they don't want you to know the truth. When there really is, if you think about it, there really is kind of a conspiracy, you know, at least on, the, you know, on the side of denying human-caused climate change, you know, on the part of, companies that you know have been demonstrated to be behind various astroturf efforts to you know spread disinformation about climate science and are firmly aware that they're causing the climate to change through their activities right. for example the, Sh the chevron papers uh from the right, 80s right. or something that came out 
uh, I don't know, the past 10 years or whatever, saying that their own internal scientists were telling the corporation that fossil fuels were changing the atmosphere and causing the planet to warm. Right. I mean, on a related, you know, related, you know, this all goes back to the tobacco companies too. Um, Merchants of doubt. was becoming more and more, when it was becoming more and more clear in the 50s that's, you know, tobacco, smoking tobacco caused lung cancer. You know, the epidemiologic evidence is stronger than pretty much, you know, it was, it's rare that you can say on epidemiology alone that something causes something. But when there's a tenfold increase in risk of an outcome associated with something, you can pretty much say that that's a cause, you know, and that's the case with you know, cigarette smoking. But in any cases, if the evidence came accumulated, accumulated, accumulated that, you know, smoking cigarettes caused cancer and other bad health outcomes, you know, the tobacco companies had their own campaign, you know, to try to push back against that. They had their own scientists, you know, their own science that was, you know, to try to counter, you know, the emerging scientific consensus about how bad smoking was for you. Um, and a lot of people these days don't remember it because it's a sort of campaign that, you know, kind of fizzled, finally fizzled, like toward, towards the end of the last century. Um, and then there were all these lawsuits where the tobacco companies had to admit what they did and were, you know, had to pay up. Um, but people forget that camp that campaign. So the funny thing about conspiracy theories and the, to distinguish from real conspiracies is, you know, there are real conspiracies, but they can be proven, you know, like they were for tobacco, you know, tobacco companies. There really are there are conspiracies. The difference between real conspiracies and conspiracy theories is that conspir real conspiracies can be proven or disproven with evidence. Conspiracy theories are notoriously unfalsifiable. <laughs> yeah, and or there's like no evidence to support any of the claims being made. So like you said, I mean, the, the key being evidence. Real conspiracies are shown to be real with evidence gone through the traditional channels, usually investigative mm -hmm. journalists, um, paired with scientists, et cetera, politicians. Inve Always. Investigations by, yeah. you know, law enforcement agencies, investigative journalists, you know, that sort of thing. Standard techniques of investigation used by those sorts of, you know, people. Yeah, that's something that I, all the time on my page, try to tell people, and even with friends and family, because Conspiracy theories are attractive and they can be fun to, to engage with a little bit. But the key point between real conspiracies, because this comes up a lot, right? They're like, oh, well, look at all of these conspiracies in the past. So, you know, this could be real. But I, again, I tell them, right. evidence. If you don't have evidence, then, you know, would this conspiracy theory hold up in a court of law, essentially? Then, well, no, it wouldn't. There's a, the, <laughs> right. And... The, another aspect of conspiracy theories is that they're ever evolving. So in other words, whenever something falsifies one major aspect of a conspiracy theory, conspiracy theory involve, evolves, to take that into account. Look at QAnon, you know, every time we've passed a milestone that QAnon sa you know, says was, you know, a showstopper, somehow the conspiracy, you know, Q conspiracy theorists managed to explain it. Um, it'll be very interesting to see how they explain it once Biden is actually finally inaugurated in a couple, you know, on, on January 20th. Yeah. Um, because, you know, because we've passed all the other milestones like Trump failing to win the election, you know, Trump failing to overturn the election results, you know, failing to show that there was, you know, massive voter fraud that caused him to appear to lose, you know, it, it, all of these milestones have been passed. And January 6th, you know, like taking over and rec reclaiming thing that passed. Um, and yeah, it just, just, keeps, you know. <laughs> just keeps, yeah, it just keeps evolving. It reminds me very similar, uh, the behavior, uh, the behavior similar to that of like a cult. Uh, for example, well, there, you know, there tell, are a couple of famous examples, right? Yeah. There's the one from the 50s that said that that set an absolute date that the world, that the aliens were going to come and the world was going to end. 
that date passed, you know, and suddenly they were saying that uh, the God, what they called the God of Earth, had been so impressed by how righteous they had been and how much light they had spread that he had decided to spare the Earth. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then they doubled down on the overall belief system. Yep. No, and that's just, it, it is absolutely remarkable. Uh, and it just keeps changing. But the followers don't ever question it. It's, uh, it doesn't, like you I said, mean, they so double down, they don't, they do, don't a even. A few do, right. A few do, but right, the vast majority don't. Yeah. Because they're so, I think it's uh, maybe a little bit of like the sunk cost fallacy. It's like they're all so heavily invested and then coupled with the, um, the psychological component, like this is who I am. I've built my life around this. It's part I have, of, the, I have, it's I part of your identity. Yes, yeah, part of your identity now. And I don't care that, you know, none of it ever comes true. I'm just going mean, to, I'm just going to go with it. And well, no, you, 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 you do, you do care, but you accept the, you accept the explanation for why predicted things didn't happen and then as time goes on like any good conspiracy theory will stop making testable predictions that are like you know that are going to happen on this date for instance you know that the, the, the predictions become vaguer you know so that yeah <laughs> and the time when they might happen becomes vaguer and so i know that you spent a lot of time <laughs> working in well obviously in medicine and then but primarily focusing as far as the you know the skeptical work the debunking the pre-bunking all of that in complementary and alternative medicine mm -hmm. and you know that is ripe with tons of conspiracy theories what do you think are some of the more pernicious ones that you've come across uh in the medical space so the, well, the pseudoscience well, and stuff like the first thing about the conspiracy theories in in most conspiracy theories in general but especially in medicine is that there is, that there is or that there is some great secret that is being kept from you by them um and what is the secret well you know cancer there is a cancer cure that they don't want you to know about in the ter in terms of like the vaccine you know anti-vaccine movement that they know that vaccines cause all this harm, but they are hiding the evidence from you. Um, you know, obviously those are two of the biggies. Um, and, you, you know, I mean, really, I like to call it the central conspiracy theory of alternative medicine is that, you know, there is that natural cures work, but they don't want you to know or that they are hiding it from you. Uh, and really, if you look at most conspiracy theories in medicine, they, they almost all boil down to a form similar to that. If you strip them of all like the, the bells and whistles and get try to, you know, get right down to the central message. Um, and, and I mean, those are like two of the big ones. Uh, oh, I mean, the, the word, I think, Clearly, COVID-19 conspiracy theories right now are the most harmful for the simple reason that they have the potential to kill the most people the quickest. Um, so the conspiracy theory that, for instance, this is that this is not a real pandemic, you know, for instance, that it is what has been called a case -edemic, you know, a case-demic. Uh, based on false positive PCR tests, you know, is a very harm, you know, obviously a very harmful one. Or, and that one basically goes, go, you know, that one fits in with anti-vaccine sorts of conspiracy theories very well. And that, you know, some of the things that anti-vaxxers have always done and that have just, have just, you know, turbocharged during the pandemic, one of them is to deny the seriousness of the disease being vaccinated against. So naturally denying how severe COVID-19 is, downplaying the risk of death, perhaps the most offensive variant of that is essentially the, is the attitude essentially that, well, you know, it only kills old people. 
<laughs> so if we could just protect the old people, you know, um, and the rest of us can go on about our lives, you know, that, that you know, or, or it only kills the sick, you know, or the old people or the people who are already sick anyway. Um, you know, uh, Del, you know, Del Big Tree, one of, you know, basically out, um, Andrew Wakefield's partner in crime making Vaxxed, you know, um, and I'm sure you've seen some of Del Big Tree's stuff before. Um, once did an episode of his video podcast that, that's called High Wire in which he basically urged his listeners to let, let's catch this cold, you know, in order to build quote unquote natural herd immunity, which is of course another really bad idea because they never seem to think that, well, if for instance, the case fatality rate of COVID-19 or let's the infection fatality rate of COVID-19 is let's say it's just 0.5%, which sounds like a really small number. But when hundreds of millions of people get infected, that's suddenly millions of deaths, you know? Yeah, right? people for some, yeah, yeah. For some exactly. reason, people don't understand the numbers when you start talking about herd immunity. And it's like, that's just and, a and, terrible idea. <laughs> and as far as, for instance, um, the actual infection fatality rate of COVID-19, uh, you know, they'll say, oh, it's no worse than the flu. And you say, okay, well, the flu, the infection fatality rate is something like 0.05% or like, you know, five in 10,000. Let me check my math. Is that correct? You know, one, yeah, one in a thousand would be 0.1%. So, <laughs> you know, uh, so 0.5 out of a thousand. Um, well, we have a hard floor of the infection fatality rate in the US for COVID-19. So something, what is it, 380, 385,000 have died of COVID-19 in one year, right? Right? Not even a Roughly. year. I mean, almost, it's a, it's almost a, a year. Almost yeah. a year. I mean, the yeah. first, I, I, that's right. I don't remember when the first fatality was recorded, but I know the first case yeah. was recorded in the US one year, it'll have been one year sometime this week, I think. I forget. The yeah, so it's about, yeah, it's fair. So it's, it's about, about a year. year. You yeah, know, it's about it's a year. Close enough, it's close enough for, for my point. That is already more than one in a thousand Americans have died of COVID-19 in just one year. And so if you, you, look you, to if what you flew... assumed a hundred <laughs> infe- percent of us were infected, that's a one in a thousand death rate or point, you know, point one percent. But we know that it's, you know, only a fraction of the population has been so far infected with COVID-19. Yeah, and we don't know what that fraction is, what that percentage is. We just know it's way under, you know, like 20% probably, you know, maybe 20% at most. If you, in some areas of the country, it may be approaching like 30 or 40%, you know, and if, and if I'm wrong on these numbers, I. If, if I'm wrong on the specifics of these numbers, I know that like roughly and close enough to make the point, you know, I'm correct enough. Cause you know, I know that at least, you know, that so we can say with confidence that the infection fatality rate has to be at least three times that, and it's probably much higher, you know, so it may well be 1%, which again, when you get into hundreds of millions of deaths, you're talking about millions of people dying. I mean, we could easily hit a half a million deaths within a month or less at the rate the you know the fatalities are piling up. Well, it's not looking so good a, right now at all. I mean, it, looking no. at the numbers, it's just it's just terrible. It's the worst that it's ever. No, been. I mean, we're talking like yeah. four thousand deaths a day, roughly, and, yeah. and going and, and it's it's horrible. And the vaccine rollout is you know been in slow a and nightmare. frustrating. Yeah, I mean. Be, I'm lucky enough to be in healthcare so that I managed to get both doses of the Pfizer vaccine uh, as of last week. Um, and I'm lucky enough to be working for a large healthcare, you know, company or you know, group, you know, a large hospital chain. 
you know, my cancer center is affiliated with, you know, a statewide hospital chain that has something like 16 or 17 hospitals, you know, throughout the state, and one in Toledo now. Um, doctors that I, you know, doctors that I know who are, for instance, in private practice, or, or even my wife is a nurse working for a private practice doctor. A lot of them still don't know how or when they're going to get their vaccinations. You know, and then there's the elderly, et cetera, et cetera. And then so, everyone else. I mean, yeah, I mean. And then everyone so, else, exactly. Yeah, I mean, we, and, and, you know, going down, the, they're going down to the lower risk people. Um, and then uh, above and beyond that, we have the newer strains. Uh, the newer strains are going around, which uh, from what we've seen so far, have higher infection rates, which means that her immunity is actually going to need to be boosted up a little bit. Well, it's going to be uh, harder to achieve herd it's immunity. It's going to be harder to achieve herd immunity. And above and beyond, yeah, even more, is that with the Pfizer, it's not a single dose. I mean, it's a, it's two doses. Right, right. So. And, 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 and even worse, you know, the whole supply chain, because it has to be stored at minus 80 degrees yeah. C. You know, I have a minus 80 degrees C freezer in my lab. Most places don't have minus 80 freezers. They're huge and expensive, suck a lot of power, they need maintenance, you know. It's <laughs> yeah, we have a, uh, we still have quite a road to, to, uh, to go down still before we can but, hope to return but, to any sort of normalcy. But uh, yeah, with the vaccines, it's. Uh, but, it, but, you know, this is just like a part of the theme though, like I said, that anti-vaxxers always try to deny or downplay the severity of the disease being vaccinated against and COVID-19 is no different. I mean, they do, they did it before for measles, you know, for a long time. I like, they're, they're, I like to call, you know, there's a, there's an example I like to call the Brady Bunch fallacy. And this is when anti-vaxxers were citing an episode of the Brady Bunch from 1969 in which the whole family got measles and it was played for laughs, you know, and saying, oh, well, back in, back in the, you know, 50 years ago, they didn't view measles as a serious thing. Maybe, but if you look at the medical literature of the time, it was quite clear that medicine viewed measles as serious, The descriptions of, you know, like one in a thousand dying of it. Gee, does that number sound familiar? <laughs> um, yeah. Or, um, or of, uh, you know, like the two in a thousand or so who get the serious neurologic complications from measles. And then there are all the other, you know, the percentage who had to be, who would have to be hospitalized for other things, even if they didn't die, you know, like secondary pneumonia and stuff like that. So, you know, they denied that. I, I mean, another favorite that they like to deny was chicken pox. Yeah. You know, like the seriousness of chicken pox. Uh, this is this is nothing new. And of now, course, another, th another thing that I've observed, and I've observed this re yeah. recently as well, is that the the anti-vaccination community will point to, and this isn't just them, um, and this trickles over to the average person too, because you know people are very mm -hmm. concerned about something that they're being asked to take that is essentially voluntary for a lot of people, uh, is the side effects. So you, sure. you know, we'll talk about. They'll point, they'll point to like terrible side effects that happen just almost 0% of the time. Like when you talk about the volumes of vaccinations that are given, the side effects occur very, very, the severe, <laughs> severe side effects. I'm not talking plug, about like plug. muscle soreness or anything like that. Plug, yeah. plug, for, plug, plug for my art, plug for my latest science-based medicine post. <laughs> it's about exactly that. Is it really? Okay. So yeah, everyone, you'll have to keep an eye out then for this, but yeah, it, it's just insane. Like medical interventions are not perfect. They do not work 100% of the time and they're not 100% safe. They're well, almost, they're almost these things. Uh, <laughs> well, well, here's another thing. So another tech, another tactic of the anti-vaccine movement going back long before the pandemic is to exaggerate the harms of vaccination or even make up harms like you know autism um, or I shouldn't say make up or you know claim harms that the vaccines are not shown to do or have even been shown not to do so I predicted and I'm not the only one so I'm not claiming any special brilliance in making this prediction when the 
COVID vaccines were first given emergency use approval, I predicted that as millions of people were vaccinated, you would hear stories of people dying after vaccination. Right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, and I, I further predicted that this would become especially apparent when it when they move beyond healthcare workers, you know, as, which was the first group being vaccinated, at least in this country, and started vaccinating the elderly. And, and this is for the simple reason that in any given length of time, say a month, way more elderly people are going to die just because they're elderly, you know, and because that's the way life is than younger, healthier people who are far less likely to die in any given period because they're young and have not approached the end of their lifespan and ha don't have all these existing comorbid conditions, you know, like heart disease, lung disease, vascular disease, uh, <clears throat> cancer, you know, whatever. Add to that a mass vaccination campaign. By when you when you look at the law, you know the law of large numbers. By random chance alone, you're going to see deaths after vaccination when you start vaccinating millions or tens of millions of people. Because just by chance, yeah. Just by <laughs> chance, because yeah. people die. You know, yeah. pe people people die, and the older you are, the more likely you are to die in any given period. It's just the way you know. It's just nature. Um, so I, you know, I predicted that you would start hearing reports of people dying, you know, within days or even sooner of being vaccinated, and that this would happen, especially happen when it got, you know, pe older people got started getting the vaccine. You know, they moved beyond healthcare workers, most of whom are younger and healthier. At least they're not. They're most of them aren't retirement age because they're still working. Um, and indeed, that's exactly what's happening. Um, for instance, you might have heard of that report of 23 people in Norway yes. who died after, yes. vaccina uh, after COVID vaccination within a week. Um, Very elderly individuals. And they were all <laughs> over 80. They yeah. were all nursing home residents. Um, and they... You know, and it's not clear whether the vaccine contributed. However, the Norwegian Medicines Agency, in what I think is, you know, an appropriate abundance of caution and appropriate, you know, abundance of transparency, you know, reported the deaths, adjusted its, and adjusted its recommendations for vaccinating the very elderly and nursing home residents, basically to say, well, it's possible that the side effects from the vaccine might have contributed to some of these deaths because these are very frail elderly people where like fever or GI symptoms or something like that might have tipped them over the edge. You know, it, it, they, they, get, they didn't say that it did, but they said that it might have, you know, that it might have been the case in some of these. So they said, so basically they changed the recommendations to say, well, in the really frail elderly population, you might want to be, you know, you might want to think twice about vaccinating some of them if you think that they can't handle the side effects. Um, in medicine, we talk about very frail people, we have kind of a crude term, but it, it, it kind of gets the point across. You know, say, you know, they're, they're so frail that they can't take a joke. And by that we mean, you know, something that you or I, or even healthier elderly people could handle, like a minor operation, for instance, you know, without much, if any, trouble cause these people enormous problems, you know, like they end up in the ICUs, they might even die, you know, um, which is why we're so reluctant to operate on these people if we don't have to. Um, 
Well, you know, maybe, you know, it's, you know, the, the Norwegian Medicines Agency basically said, well, maybe these people are so frail that even the side effects could have tipped them over the edge. You know, um, some of these, some of these, I guess some of these people were actually already terminally ill. You know, they, cancer, they, 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 they didn't break it down. I wish there had been a bit more detail in the report. Uh, as I recall, they but, vaccinated terminally ill individuals. I, I, well, they mentioned terminally ill, so I assume okay. that they must have. Um, oh wow! Okay. But term, but remember, terminally ill could mean could be years. I suppose that you have so, a year or yeah. two left. You yeah, know? that's true. Uh, Depending on what your condition I, is. I, I mean, there's terminally ill is you're going to die in a few days or a few weeks, and there's terminally ill where you have like a slow growing stage four cancer that probably won't kill you for a couple of years. You know, there's that. Um, in those patients, I could certainly say, well, you know, well, sure, they should be protected from COVID. They have at least several months, if not a couple of years left. You know, they might even have longer because, you know, there's, there's a bell-shaped curve. You know, they, they could be fortunate enough to be on the long end of that bell-shaped curve. So, um, no. But it, but in any event, you know, there was an article by uh, who else? RFK Jr. <laughs> argue, that basically argued. Well, that, that's another. Here's what. Here, here's another characteristic when evaluating these deaths, you know, or evaluating any adverse event after a vaccination, is you have to know the background rate of death or that particular issue. You know in the population being vaccinated and then you can sort of compare and infer and see is there you know are you seeing it at a higher rate and people are getting vaccinated because there will be some cases by random chance alone again uh, when you look at large numbers and most yeah. people just don't don't understand that because we're pattern seeking animals and if you got vaccinated three days ago and have a heart attack today, it must have been the vaccine. Even if you're like a 91 year old, which is, this is a real case from one of the lists, you know, one of the, not from, from, a, from a, the article that RFK Jr. wrote, uh, I believe he was in Israel, but a 91 year old with a pr prior history of heart disease has a heart attack and dies, but he happened to be vaccinated recently probably not the vaccine it might be but it's probably not you know given <laughs> so yeah yeah no i definitely the the number of stories and those are going to be amplified too throughout the well, you know the anti-vaccine community um even the news agencies too because obviously right fear, right. Well, fear sells they want to drive clicks so right and again if you don't have medical training or if you don't have training actually looking at these things, you know, or looking at adverse events after any medical intervention, but especially a mass intervention like vaccination where you're vaccinating millions and millions and millions, and ultimately we hope billions of people, um, you, you know, we human beings are not hardwired to accept that there's such a thing as coincidence in that. Um, like I said, you know, we're pattern seeking creatures and the anti-vaccine, you know, and, and, you know, the tabloid media just does that, not necessarily out of any more nefarious than usual motivation, you know, than their usual desire for sensationalism, you know, to publicize those cases, you know, they, the, the tabloid media, especially in England, does that, you know, the Daily Mail is notorious for it. Um, but the anti-vaccine movement weaponizes that normal human cognitive, you know, I shouldn't say quirk, but you know, cognitive feature where we don't easily accept that two things that we, two things are a coincidence when they happen close together and it seems to us like they should be causative. Uh, you know, which led to, in this article, you know, in this article, RFK Jr. is basically mocking the idea of coincidence when evaluating vaccine adverse events 
and, and this isn't the first time he's done it, and this isn't the first time anti-vaxxers have done it. They were doing it long before the pandemic. They were doing it for the claim that vaccines cause autism. You know, you know, dismissing it. You're coincidence. It can't be coincidence. You know, or, yeah. uh, and and in this case, he's like kind of starting to spin it into a conspiracy theory, you know, related to, you know, they don't want you to know, but basically, oh, well, we'll never know how many people the vaccine killed because of the tendency of everybody to immediately uh, ascribe any death to coincidence. You know, it, 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 he, I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what he, what he said. And you know, you know, my response is that's that's not exactly what's happening. What what is happening is doctors are saying we don't know if it's causative. It could have been coincidence. You know, that that's you know, and from what we know, it's probably not causation that we're seeing. But to leave open the possibility that it might be, you know, not, now that that's actually more skepticism than, you know, what the anti-vaxxers are saying. To say, well, it's probably not causation, but we need to investigate because, you know, it, it, yeah, it there's a there's a small chance that it could be. Well, the key being, like, let's not jump to conclusions. We need to exactly. do. Right. We need to do. We need to. We need to do our due diligence. Okay. It's a bit scary. Yeah, I understand that people are concerned. Something might be going on here, so let's investigate it further. We can't really say one way or another. It's probably not it, based off of everything we're seeing. But we're going to go ahead and investigate. Also, in the context of a global pandemic, where we can say. With a great, with a huge degree of certainty now, that being vaccinated against COVID nineteen is a hell of a lot less risky than having COVID, you know, than getting COVID nineteen. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Um, you, you think of it in that context. Uh, but you know, you know, and another, um, what was I going to say? Another way to respond is, you know, basically. Oh, I, that's what I was, here's what I was going to say. You noticed another feature of science deniers and conspiracy theorists, theorists is projection. They accuse their critics of doing what they're doing. So RFK Jr. is accusing health authorities of jumping to conclusions that it's a coincidence. You know, this, this, this adverse event, this death, it's after the vaccination. It's a coincidence, you know, like jumping to that conclusion is what he's saying. When he's jumping to the conclusion that it's the vaccine. Yeah, no, yeah, that's definitely a common <laughs> the, the projection, and I've, I've seen that a lot this uh, past political election season as well, mm -hmm. um, with the projection as a common deflection technique to try mm -hmm. to take off to, to try to take the tension away from yourself and put it back onto the other person who's uh, you know, making the criticism to begin with. But yeah, it's, uh, you, you know, what you were saying about with the anti-vaccination movement always being there and some of the same arguments that have yeah. commonly been used have been translated over into COVID. Uh, I mean, Oh, oh, I'll give you they, a it's always, it's always, it's always, yeah, it's always been there, but like to the, the degree of harm right now during, exactly. a pan, but, during a pandemic, it's just unforgivable. I, I mean, it never really was before, but like the, it's just been amplified so much during the pandemic. I, I, and, I, you know, we've had, we have this just cocktail of just disinformation, you know, the conspiracy theories, the fake news, the the, the, the lies, uh, it's just crazy. This infodemic that has come along with the right. pandemic has really just well, made just made a mess of things. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a couple of quickie other, you know, oldies, but oldie moldies that I like to call them, you know, uh, from the anti-vaccine movement that have been recycled for COVID. You know, there's the, now the claim that COVID vaccines are rendering women infertile. You, have you heard that one yet? 
it's out there. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure it's out there. There's uh, another the micro, one. The there's, micro tripping one that's been recycled. I mean, that's been that's, recycled. The one, the, yeah. uh, the the one that the the one the claim that mRNA vaccines like the Pfizer and the uh, Moderna vaccines reprogram your DNA. You've heard I that. I have one, heard I'm that. Sure. Oh yeah, I've heard that's, that. That's that's not a new one. They've been anti-vaxxers have been claiming that vaccines reprogram your DNA for a long time. So it's, you know, I, 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 you know, I resurrected some old posts of mine from several years ago where they were making that claim about various vaccines. So it's, you know, um, the only thing that they have not claimed yet, and I say yet, is that the COVID vaccines cause autism. And I think the only reason they haven't started making that claim yet is because none of them are approved for children yet, and we're not vaccinating young children against COVID yet. But when we do, but when we do, when yes. we do, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that we can plan on that being resurrected as well, and that being uh, or recycled, I should say, from the traditional uh, one of one, one of the old from the MMR older, or you yeah, know, yeah, the, the, yeah. Other. Yes, precisely. So anyway, I'm just curious as to what your thoughts are. So we'll start wrap, wrapping things up here, but. Uh, what your thoughts are, how people can protect themselves against uh, like this infodemic, I suppose, is what we could call it. So all of the nonsense, you know, in particular nowadays, because we're dealing with the, the anti-vaccination movement has come kind of front and center with all of these arguments that, you know, distort people's views of reality, what's really going on, like how can sure. people protect themselves what resources would you recommend? Obviously, science-based medicine is a well, great science -based resource. Well, science-based medicine yeah. is, you know, you know, and I always have to give a plug for Steve Novella's Skeptic's Guide to the Universe and his blog. Um, there's, uh, there are a number of experts on Twitter um, that I, you know, who are out there combating the disinformation and I'd have you know a hard time listing them all at the moment but uh, it, that I for instance follow um, that you know one thing that I one thing that I think can help that's kind of again going back to being meta you know is like if you start to recognize tactics and also recognize the features of a conspiracy theory so for instance, if someone is making a claim and then saying that there's a sh there's a shadowy cabal trying to keep you know you yes you from knowing the secret information, you know that's a conspiracy theory. He's probably peddling bullshit. You know uh, if you start to recognize it kind of on a higher level, like what the features of conspiracy theories are, you'll start seeing those features showing up in these arguments all the time. And if you can recognize them, you know, they, it, that, you know, it can sort of set, you know, get your skeptical antennae starting to twitch, you know, at what claims they're making. Um, and then you could go to more, you know, better sources of information, more reliable sources of information, more science-based sources of information um, to see, you know, if that claim is in fact nonsense. But, you know, once you start to recognize some of those features, and then also, you know, learn, learn your logical fallacies. <laughs> um, I mean, to be honest, all humans use logical fallacies from one time or another, including, I'm sure, me occasionally inadvertently. It's just like really hard not to. But if you start seeing primary arguments that are logical fallacies, like, you know, the uh, can, you know, the uh, propter hoc ergo propter, you know, I forget the Latin, you know, the confusing correlation with causation. Or, or false cause. cause. I, I just go, I, 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 cause, I default yeah. to false cause because the Latin term is a bit Well, no, the, the Latin, I, yeah. I, was, I, was, yeah. I could already tell I was screwing up the Latin and I stopped myself. I think it's <laughs> post, po, post hoc post ergo oh, you're propter right. it's hoc. Post hoc ergo propter hoc, right, it's post -hoc, yeah, it's pro -hoc, -hoc like which means, yes. um, what after something like after therefore or, therefore it ca the cause or something like that i, I forget exactly for those of you listening it, yeah or watching yeah, Google yeah it. And then go to go to go to rational wiki it'll tell you yeah there you go 
There you go. Oh, another good source though. <laughs> yes, Rational Wiki is a great source, particularly when it comes to like any of the Basic philosophical razors, yeah, like the... skeptical stuff, um, fallacies, things of that nature. Very, very good. But yeah, definitely, you know, I agree with you learning the basics of logic. So the logical fallacies, things of that, how arguments are structured and why, why it is that a logical fallacy even renders an argument bad in the first place. So that way, mm -hmm. I mean, that will help you in all areas of life is what I tell people. I mean, not just when- Sure, yeah, yeah, ex oh, yeah. definitely. And not, not just pseudoscience, not just conspiracy theories, you know. It'll help you in politics, you know, yeah, like, absolutely. for instance. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, um, you know, um, but you can't be an expert in everything. No. You can't even, and if you don't have a science background, you can't even be an expert in a lot of sciences. So the way you have to, you have to learn, you know, like that's why I talk about getting, you know, going up on this more meta, higher level, of, you know, like learning fallacies of argumentation, you know, the logical fallacies, learning the characteristics of conspiracy theories, so that when you start seeing an argument that's based in a conspiracy theory, you can suddenly start to think uh, maybe that argument is not so good or maybe it's yeah. bullshit because they're invoking a conspiracy theory to support it um so <laughs> you know yeah no absolutely i think um uh, i mean i categorically agree with the notion that being more educated about like knowing how to think essentially um right which when it comes critical to like, thinking, like, critical thinking if you want to call it that. yeah there we go critical thinking we'll go ahead and we'll go ahead and say it. But yeah well I, I think it starts with philosophy though like learning learning logic and things of that nature <clears throat> argument structure i uh, i definitely agree with that particular point but anyway david i just i wanted to thank you so much for coming on okay, i mean it's been a, it's been a great chat where can people where can people find you like on social media obviously you know we talked about your your blog respect science based med science-based was yeah respectfulinsolence.com, you know, one word. On Twitter, you know, Gorskon is my handle, G-O-R-S-K-O-N. Um, and I mean, those are the main places. I'm not big, I, you know, I'm not big on Instagram. I, you know, my Instagram account basically has pictures of the puppies we've fostered and you know, <laughs> nothing much about skepticism or anything like that. Yeah, um, but you are very active on Twitter. I'm, I've noticed that because I do follow yeah, you on Twitter. Too, There's yeah, a bunch of good information. Say, some might say so. too active. <laughs> some might might well say too actor active. Yeah. We all need we all need our social media advice. We have right. you know you choose one that you like to be the most active on. So uh, amusingly, amusingly, I did when when that the whole thing about parley you know was going on. I signed up for an account, although I never. I was on more, more out of. Parler, parlay, yeah, I thought it was yeah. parlay. Is in the maybe French it is parlay. Word. I don't know. Parlay in French means to speak. Okay, so, so maybe um, it is. Maybe it is parlay. So I don't know. I, in any event, I signed up for an account just out, just for yucks, and it was more out of curiosity to see what was going on there. And oh my goodness, <laughs> I didn't sign up for an account. I, I did not. Uh, post my youngest, other than... yeah, my my youngest sister did, and she said it's basically nothing but like Nazi propaganda is it's what basically she, she all found. it's it's all it's all basically QAnon, white supremacist anti-vaccine yeah. and covid denial uh, you know all, that's basically all it is yeah i mean just a platform of just complete nonsense but i mean i mean anyway, i thought it yeah. was i thought it might have been useful to give me blogging ideas because i mean yeah. i i have i'm i've signed up for a, a bunch of you know email lists from you know various cranks and quacks just because it sometimes it gives me ideas for blog posts but uh, you know it also keeps me on you know keeps my finger on the pulse of what the latest uh bogus yeah. claims and quackery is but you know anyway uh again thank you so much and right. uh, no, you're well, thanks thanks for inviting me yeah absolutely As absolutely again great conversation and for those of you that are tuning in uh, you know Definitely go and check David out on Twitter. Uh, those two websites that he mentioned, the mm -hmm. Respectful Insolence as well as the mm -hmm. Science-Based Medicine are 
fantastic resources right now during the pandemic, mm -hmm. particularly as we begin to roll out the vaccines, uh, because there's a lot of disinformation being propagated, conspiracy theories, et cetera, about that. So those are great resources yeah. to go and uh, frequent if you have any questions in regards to COVID-19 vaccinations. Mm -hmm. So everyone take care and stay tuned for more great content in the future.